first of all, thank you all for being here. Um, I wanted to start by uh, talking about the place we're in. So uh, a couple of days ago, uh, we all mentioned the uh, three reasons to celebrate and congratulate uh, the UAE, your national day, um, the uh, 50th anniversary of it, Expo 2020, and of course, uh, the holding of the WPC. Uh, which is in itself a, a remarkable achievement because, as was mentioned earlier, it's the first major uh, intellectual event that is being held uh, in person. So I'm the Iraqi ambassador to the United States. And today, for me, is also a very special day. Um, we have actually two reasons to celebrate. The first is, in about a week, we will be holding elections. They're important. There are second uh, post-ISIS elections, and uh, all signals indicate that uh, things are going uh, not ideally, but uh, reasonably well to, for us to be quite hopeful. Um, the second reason is that uh, today uh, has been decided to, by the Council of Ministers to be Iraq's national holiday. Uh, it marks the adhesion of the uh, Iraqi state, uh, freshly out of the uh, um, post-World World War I mandate into the League of Nations. That happened 99 years ago. Now, I mention it because uh, very shortly thereafter, the uh, representative of Iraq to the League of Nations was a certain Muzahim al Pachachi, who eventually be became prime minister, but I mention him because he is the father of Adnan Pachachi, who was uh, one of the uh, friends of uh, Sheikh Zayed, uh, Minister of State of Abu Dhabi, and also the person who raised the uh, uh, UAE flag at the United Nations. And I mention this because he was, I was close to him, I was one of his advisors, and it is with him that I went back to Iraq after an absence of 30 years on board a UAE plane. So, uh, if I'm here, it's partly because of that. So when I say thank you to the United Arab Emirates, really thank you. Not at all, thank you. Um, we've had uh, so far two days of very high value content. Uh, we're all the richer for it. One of the things that I noticed uh, that I want to highlight is the fact that uh, such meetings um, show world complexity as it is. You know, the interplay between globalization, the need, uh, as was mentioned earlier by a uh, previous speaker, uh, that to, in order for us to, to solve our problems, we need to work together uh, to face real problems. The impact of the pandemic is one, uh, addressing the digital world. We've covered uh, regions of tensions between the EU, the US, China, the problems of finance. And we've spent some time talking about issues that really need uh, global governance in order to be addressed. Uh, global terrorism. Uh, I will mention that, for example, the anti-ISIS coalition now, led by the United States, but it's also including many countries, including the UAE and Iraq, uh, counts about 83 participants. Uh, the financial crisis, uh, we all know the role of the G20 to address it, the pandemic, the role of uh, the World Health Organization and COVAX, and then of course the uh, major threats of the, to the environment uh, which are existential. Uh, and uh, uh, to give you a number, I think at this point we have 190 participants uh, or adherents to the uh, uh, Paris Accord. There are other issues that I think need to be addressed globally. For example, the fight uh, against corruption, which is one of the elements that, uh, that fosters and sponsors, sponsors uh, global terrorism. But anyway, today here, we are uh, here to focus on the Middle East and uh, its relationships with external powers. And this is not new. The Middle East has been the focus of external powers uh, for quite a long time, 
All I need to do is mention Napoleon uh, following colonization by European powers of um, several countries in the Middle East, um, World War I, the League of Nation mandates, uh, the discovery of oil. Um, it's uh, interesting, uh, our friend Arnaud Boyac reminded me that in fact Total Energie uh, was born uh, many, many years ago in Iraq, uh, as was for, the, for that matter OPEC. The famous Quincy meeting, the, uh, which exemplifies the relationship between the United States and, uh, and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, the creation of the State of Israel. Uh, then the Cold War with uh, the Baghdad Pact and other groupings. Um, then the Kuwait War uh, with Bush 41. The global war on terror with uh, Bush 43, uh, including Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, more recently, um, there was the advent of the pivot to Asia by uh, the Obama administration, withdrawal from Iraq, adhesion to the JCPOA, but eventually they had to return militarily uh, because of Libya, because of ISIS. And then, of course, uh, the emergence of global concerns, uh, COP21, and uh, the need to address climate change. Followed by the Trump administration, Trump actually characterized his diplomacy by being very personal. Um, uh, the Trump administration pursued the war on terror, but it withdrew from the JCPOA and the Paris Accord, and that ratcheted up tensions in, in the region. Uh, um, uh, we all remember the killing of uh, General Qasem Soleimani in, in, in Baghdad. Uh, they started negotiations with the Taliban, um, and then, of course, uh, culminating with the Abraham Accords uh, that were mentioned earlier. Of course, uh, many countries, um, this is, as was mentioned, a, a very controversial and, and, and emotional topic in the Middle East. Some countries have adhered, adhered for reasons of their own. Uh, others will not. Uh, I, can, I can hardly imagine that Iraq will adhere to the, uh, to the Abraham Accord. Um, but this, in fact, is an expression of um, national interest. Morocco adhered for its own reasons, as did Saddam. Now we're dealing with the Biden administration. Their focus is on China. It is quite clear that uh, to all of us, in fact, that our role, our part in the global mind space of Washington is going to diminish. Um, the focus will shift towards the Pacific. Um, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which uh, many have considered, uh, in fact, I think uh, maybe Renaud Girard is here. Uh, he called it the first uh, strategic defeat of the United States. So we have a straight stage that is set of a region where you have an interplay between uh, global powers, uh, the ambitions of emerging regional powers, uh, and national interest by countries uh, who want to assert their sovereignty, all under the umbrella of global concerns that we have to address altogether. I mentioned climate change. Uh, water is an important, another important issue. Uh, food security, um, global terrorism, so to discuss these issues, we have a really stellar cast. Um, I'll introduce them as they, I give them the floor. Uh, I will start with our host, uh, uh, the ambassador of uh, the United Arab Emirates to uh, Turkey since 2016, His Excellency Khalifa Shaheen al Um He's a veteran a diplomat. He was posted to Syria and Iran prior to that but had also postings um, in Japan and the United Nations. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I would just start with uh, thanking the organizers of this uh, uh, conference. Uh, and uh, as we uh, touch on the Middle East and uh, 
external powers. I, I, I would say that Middle East has been always of a strategic importance to the world powers and to international community as a whole. Because of its strategic location, because of its resources of energy, and because of that, the state of security and, and the stability of the region has its effects on the region as a whole and on the international community as well. And with the engagement of world powers in, in, in the Middle East comes also there's rivalries and there's competition among world powers. But also we have to acknowledge that there is uh, a legitimate concerns and the legitimate interest of both powers in the development in the Middle East of the, so far as the security and stability of the Middle East is concerned. Now, with that concern, we think there is a positive uh, contribution world power can contribute to the future of the region. The Middle East and in our region, especially during the last decade or so, has been going through a lot of crises, conflicts that uh, took a lot of efforts and resources and uh, uh, shook the foundation of the national state institutions. Now, there is a consensus among Arab countries that any malicious intervention in the crises in the, in the region only exacerbate this crisis, exacerbate the conflicts, and uh, uh, make a very complex situation more, more complex. So, what we think that needed is to promote stability, to promote security, and to promote peaceful uh, uh, resolution of conflicts. And that's what we in MRS focusing on. We have been always promoting stability in the region, working for the stability in the region, and promoting a stability that could lead to prosperity and to preserve uh, security, a long-term security of the region. And in that quest, we have uh, promoted uh, uh, building bridges with, with, the, with the, uh, all the countries and all the uh, uh, nations of the, of the region. And we have working for the prosperity, settlement, peaceful settlement of conflicts for prosperity and for long-term stability and security for the region. Now, we think that what needed from the uh, 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 world powers, as, as well as the regional powers, first to in, refrain from interfering into the internal affairs of the Arab countries, assist into finding peaceful solutions to the conflicts, and also assist into building, rebuilding the, the, the region. So, with all the challenges we are facing in the region, there is more connection is needed to connect with all, all the countries, to uh, have dialogue, and to promote peace and security, and a, 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 a peaceful settlement of, of, of conflicts. Now, Abraham Accords is one example of that. And here I have to emphasize that 
uh, Abraham Accords, we, when we uh, signed the Abraham Peace Accords, we giving an example how to solve the problems, how to solve conflicts, rather than only managing the conflicts. And to work into a warm peace that reflects tangible results and give tangible results to the population and that the, the region would see the benefits of peace. The other issue that we have been emphasizing that the Abraham Accords is not directed against any third party in the, in the region. And with our emphasis on, on, on uh, uh, connections, on dialogue, on looking into the ways and means to mitigate the uh, 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 adverse effects of, inter of external intervention in the in internal affairs of, of, of the Arab countries, and into connecting and creating uh, more space of cooperation, more space of promoting economic and, and, and investment and the well-being and the prosperity for all the regions, that would affect positively the quest for uh, solving the conflicts and problems in the region. So I would stop here and then uh, Thank you, continue sir. the over. So dialogue, uh, search for prosperity, um, and engagement. Um, thank you. Um, and the UAE has been doing all of that. Um, we also have with us from Moscow, uh, Professor Vitaly Nomkin, who is uh, the president of the Institute of Oriental Studies at the Russian Academy of Sciences, um, senior political advisor to the SRSG on Syria, and a professor at Moscow State University. Um, Russia, Russia is a player in the region, as we know. Uh, and I give you the floor, sir. If you could give us your point of view. Thank you. That's it. Can you hear me? Well, I'm with you. Uh, professor uh, Nopkin, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning. Good, good morning. morning. It's a great honor and a big privilege for me to be with you and to speak to this distinguished audience. So I'm speaking about uh, Russia's role in the Middle East in the realm of the external powers presence there. Uh, we can see that uh, during the last years, uh, um, the Middle East uh, came back to, the Russian, to, to Russia's priorities in Russia's uh, foreign policy. Uh, why? Because uh, first uh, Russia started to establish itself as one of the most important uh, uh, players uh, in the world, global players and regional players as well. Uh, then uh, the fact that uh, Russia's ties with the Middle East are uh, historic, they are based on the legacy of very deep cooperation and uh, links between the uh, peoples of the Middle East and the Russian people. And um, if we compare the, what is happening now in the realm of uh, the, uh, Russia's presence and relations uh, with the Middle Eastern states, for instance, with the 90s, uh, when Russia almost uh, disappeared from the scene of this region, uh, it's a bit different. But I cannot say that some people will say that Russia returned to the Middle East. We can say that uh, Russia uh, successfully uh, upgraded its presence or its influence in the Middle East and uh, started from uh, uh, 2015. Uh, we can see uh, the new phase of Russia's relations with the Middle East. Uh, we can say that it's, uh, it's proactive. It started with the presence of the Russia's uh, air forces uh, and their operation in Syria. And uh, uh, speaking about the goals of Russia's presence, we can see that it's mostly 
the same interest as uh, what uh, my colleagues said about the other external powers. I can say that it's uh, uh, cooperation between uh, Russia and uh, the Middle East uh, economically, politically, even militarily, given that, for instance, Russia needs uh, some moderate facilities for serving its uh, fleet in the Mediterranean. That's why <coughs> uh, Russia's base is in Syria are fulfilling this goal. But it's a secondary goal. The first goal, of course, is interest uh, of uh, stability in the Middle East, security in this region, because it's very close uh, to the borders of uh, Russia's partners in Central Asia and the Caucasus. And uh, we can see also that non-Arab states uh, started uh, uh, as they probably the most important uh, partners of Russia in the beginning of this space, uh, and then other states uh, um, entered uh, the group of, of the most close partners of Russia. If we speak about Turkey, for instance, as one of the non arab partners, it's uh, uh, the most amazing, the most important uh, uh, economic contracts and projects like uh, uh, nuclear power station or plant uh, or uh, the Turkish stream gas pipeline. <laughs> and even if we take the uh, volume of tourism that just before pandemic in uh, uh, 2019, the numbers of tourists uh, from Russia to uh, Turkey exceeded 7 million. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of other things as well, you know, especially turning uh, Turkey into the uh, uh, gas uh, hub uh, for, for exporting Russia's uh, gas to, to Europe. We can see that deterring the different threats coming from this region, unfortunately, uh, uh, especially terrorism and religious extremism, it's also one of the goals of, of Russia. And we can say that the uh, relative calm in, in Syria, regardless of what uh, the others uh, think about that, is also the result of Russia's uh, relative success in uh, deterring this uh, threat and uh, reading this country from uh, from the from Dutch. Uh, uh, we can see some some other important uh, uh, you know links between Russia or bridges between Russia and the region. I think that uh, it is due to also to Russia's ability to adjust to the growing role of the of regional processes and dynamics, especially its readiness to play with key regional powers as a need. Uh, we can see that it it is built upon Russia's practice of reaching out to multiple partners and uh, built on non-ideological approach and uh, pragmatic. We can see that Russia uh, is trying to uh, to build relationships with all players, with uh, uh, different uh, uh, parties and states. Uh, for instance, Iran and Israel on an equal, on an equal basis. And that's uh, because of that Russia is capable of uh, uh, playing uh, uh, the role of mediator uh, uh, in all uh, regional countries, uh, as we can see. At the same time, our approach is non-interventionist. Uh, we have no uh, colonial uh, legacy, which is helping us uh, in this relationship. Russia is not seeking uh, to replace or to compete some global powers, especially the United uh, States. If there's no desire and capability, uh, by the way, to uh, to compete the United States, uh, but Russia has its own place, has its own place. I can see that uh, after the what happened in Afghanistan, uh, there might be some also new role of Russia because uh, uh, I'm not speaking in, in, in the in the uh, 
uh, using expressions like the, the United States defeat or something like that. No, it's a new, but it's a new state, and there is some loss of loss of trust towards the United States, as, as uh, we all know. But Russia is not going to uh, capitalize, to, to, uh, capitalize on, on this, but at the same time, uh, we can feel some, some sort of uh, readiness from the regional partners <coughs> uh, to work more closely with Russia. I see, uh, I can see that it's, it's quite possible. And uh, even during the days of, 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 of uh, pandemia, because the Russian vaccines are working well, and used uh, in this region. I can especially mention the so-called uh, new partners of Russia, new, uh, new friends, especially the Gulf states. So for instance, Egypt is an old uh, partner and an old friend. Uh, the same about uh, Syria and, and, and Iraq, but uh, uh, Israel is a new, a new, a new uh, partner and friend. And Iran is the same, and, and the Gulf states are also the same. One example of, of how Russia is trying to reach out to different partners or different players, I would say, uh, even uh, those uh, who are not quite, uh, quite friendly to, to Russia, is uh, our dialogue uh, with Taliban, uh, our uh, team of negotiators, uh, have been uh, meeting uh, the Taliban leaders during seven years. Seven years. They were coming to Moscow. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Negotiating with our team. Uh, despite the fact that the Taliban are on the list of uh, terrorist organizations, are still there. And nobody is going now to uh, take them out of this list. We, can, we will see what's going to happen. So it means that uh, we're trying to build relationships with all uh, because we need the peace, we need stability, we need some, some presence who are serving our interests. I can see also that, <coughs> <coughs> that given our relationships with other outside powers, uh, yes, it's, uh, we have very difficult and complicated relationships with the West in general, and especially with the United States. But still, uh, we have some limited uh, cooperation when it's necessary. For instance, Russia played a significant role uh, in uh, 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 JCPOA process, being a part of 5 plus 1. The same about many resolutions of Security Council, Council that were uh, passed during last year. Uh, some cooperation with the United States uh, uh, in exchanging information about terrorists and uh, Russia's proposals uh, regarding the establishment of regional or new regional security system, inclusive system, which enjoys uh, support from, uh, from some partners, not all of them, but, but some partners who are thinking seriously about that. I could say also that some regional conflicts that are almost neglected now by many global and regional players, like uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict, is in the still in the center of uh, of uh, the attention of the Russian diplomacy, because Russia believes that without the solution to the uh, Palestinian problem. Uh, no peace can be uh, achieved in the Middle East. Uh, coming back to the recent uh, developments uh, of, of, of uh, Russia's uh, relations uh, with the Middle East partners, I can uh, name oil and gas cooperation with uh, the states like Saudi Arabia, uh, deep cooperation in the oil market, our very good relationship with the United Arab Emirates. It's a reliable, reliable and very good uh, partner for Russia uh, in many uh, fields. And uh, I think that uh, I can stop here and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Well, uh, after this uh, view from Moscow, uh, let's move to Washington. 
uh, to the Honorable Stuart Eisenstadt, who I discovered uh, had uh, represented the United States already at uh, Kyoto in, in 1997. Um, he has a stellar career uh, in working for the uh, U.S. government. Uh, he had been uh, Under Secretary of State on two occasions, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, and of course he's well known for having uh, resolved many of the pending issues uh, that uh, uh, Holocaust survivors uh, had to deal with to recover some of the assets that were confiscated by the Nazis. Uh, uh, Mr. Eisenstadt, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, and I'm sorry that I can't be with you personally. I want to first outline the policy goals of the Biden administration in general. First is to move from the Trump administration's America first unilateralism and neo-isolationism to an America fully engaged as a leader to solve global problems and promote global order and the rule of law. Second is to reinvigorate alliances with Europe, with NATO and the European Union, which I had been ambassador in the Clinton administration, and with the Asian Pacific countries to take on 21st century challenges. First is to deal with anti-terrorism, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, Second, global health issues, particularly the COVID pandemic, where the administration has donated more vaccines to COVAX for Africa and developing countries than any other country. Third is a real emphasis, which was totally rejected by the previous administration, on climate change. Former Secretary of State John Kerry has been designated as the leader and we're pointing toward Glasgow. But we realize that this also requires global cooperation. The U.S. emits only 15% of the world's emissions. And we need to enlist other countries if we're going to meet the Paris goals. As we speak now, the administration is seeking legislation and a sharply divided Congress for the Biden administration's Go Back Better program, which has a substantial climate change component. And I believe with all the divisions that we've read, that by the end of this month, a substantial part of that package will pass. A third priority of the foreign policy is to enlist allies to deal with the challenge of China which is considered by the administration the greatest geopolitical challenge. Secretary Blinken has put it very clearly this way. We will compete economically, technologically, and militarily with China. We will collaborate wherever possible with China, for example, on climate change. And if need be, confront China when it moves in inappropriate ways in areas like the South China Sea. A fourth concept and goal of the Biden foreign policy is to relate it to domestic policy. The belief that a stronger America at home will mean a stronger America abroad. Now let me be frank in talking about the problems with these goals and then I'll move directly to the Middle East. The first problem in achieving these goals is, quite frankly, the United States, which is still the strongest power militarily and economically, does not have the unchallenged supremacy it did 10 to 15 years ago, dealing with the rise of China, with a more assertive and aggressive Russia, and with the rise of regional powers from North Korea to Iran and beyond. Second, it's very difficult to achieve many of these goals without the projection of military force. 
And here the absence of boots on the ground, the loss of Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan, the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan without prior notification to our allies who actually had more troops in Afghanistan than did the U.S. Combined with the submarine deal with Australia have led to problems in seeking to build and rebuild those alliances. At the same time, the administration has continued Trump-era tariffs on European steel and aluminum and on China. Let me move now to the Middle East. I have to be candid, and I'm not, of course, speaking for the administration, but someone who I think uh, is quite knowledgeable about the administration and knows many of its key players and worked with them in previous administrations. The administration sees the Middle East as a lower priority on its foreign policy agenda than dealing with China and Russia and the Asia Pacific. The Middle Eastern wars have drained and diverted trillions of dollars from domestic needs. And in an era of high domestic polarization politically, there is bipartisan agreement to focus more on China and less on what are called endless wars. To move from a policy based on military force to what President Biden called in his UN address, relentless diplomacy. Now let me quote, quote my good friend, Secretary of State Tony Blinken. And he said, just as a matter of time allocation and budget priorities, I think we'll be giving less to the Middle East, not more. The National Security Advisor, Greg Sullivan, said that one of the mistakes of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East over the last several decades under both Republican and Democratic administrations was putting greater priority to military than diplomatic components. In their recently released Interim National Security Strategy Guidelines, it is notable how little attention has been given in that document to the Middle East. There is a statement about maintaining ironclad commitments to Israel and its security and promoting a two-state solution. But there is a realization that trying to relaunch the kind of aggressive peace process that then Secretary of State Kerry did in 2014 and the Obama administration is not going to be fruitful. Neither side is prepared to make the kinds of compromises that would make such a peace agreement possible. Therefore, the administration will put greater emphasis than the previous administration on improving the lives of Palestinians and opposing the expansion of Israeli settlement, which would complicate an eventual two-state solution. The second piece of this new national security strategy is to work with regional partners in the Middle East to deter Iranian aggression. The third component of the Middle East piece of this strategy is to disrupt al-Qaeda and related terrorist networks and to prevent a resurgence of ISIS. And next is to resolve armed conflicts. But with a clear statement, and I'm virtually quoting from this document, that we do not believe that military force is the answer to the recent challenges, and we will not give our partners in the Middle East 
and that means in part Saudi Arabia, what they call in their document a blank check to pursue policies at odds with American interests and values. And they say in this document, that is why we have withdrawn U.S. support for offensive military operations in Yemen and backed U.N. efforts to end the war. They state that our aim will be to de-escalate regional tensions and create space for people throughout the Middle East to realize their aspirations. They further state that in the Middle East, we will right-size, and frankly, that's a diplomatic term for reduce, our military presence to the level required to disrupt international terrorist networks, to deter Iranian aggression, and protect other vital U.S. interests. Now, I believe that those would have been better served if we had continued to keep 3,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan, uh, but that obviously was not the decision that the president made. Now, beyond that, there will be support for the Trump era Abraham Accords and an effort to expand them. There will, in my opinion, be continued support for the condition of Morocco entering into normalized relations with Israel, mainly Moroccan sovereignty over the Western Sahara. And I've been to Morocco many, many times and have the privilege of serving on an advisory board of OCP, one of their largest companies. I think also the administration will continue to keep Sudan off the terrorist list, so-called SST list, which was their condition for normalization. Now, let me close with talking about Iran. The administration recently used military force against Iranian-backed militias that were targeting U.S. coalition forces, their ambassador in your country, in Iraq. There is a strong desire to get Iran back into the JCPOA, and there is a feeling that the decision by President Trump to withdraw from it, with all its imperfections, has opened the door for Iran to break through the limits of the 2015 agreement and to get perilous close to a ability to produce weapons-grade nuclear fuel. If I can be more specific, under the 2015 JCPOA, Iran was limited to enrich uranium enrichment to less than 4%. And may I say to my Russian colleague, Russia played a very constructive role in the JCPOA, not just in the negotiations, but it was the location in which Iran sent its enriched uranium. Now, since the Trump administration withdrew, Iran is building large stockpiles of rich uranium to 20%, even to 60%, with faster spinning centrifuges, which are very close to weapons grade. And experts believe it is only a short few months to be able to reach that weapons grade level. And they've gone from having 300 to over 3,000 kilograms of enriched uranium. Now, let me give a forecast, which may or may not turn out to be correct, but it is the best assumption I can make. And for many years, I have paired the Atlantic Council's Iran Task Force, a think tank, uh, on Iran. I've met with former and Foreign Minister Zarif on several occasions. And I think it is a tragedy that during a more moderate regime with 
President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif, we couldn't have built on the JCPOA. Instead, we now have a very hardline new government under Abraham Raisi. And the foreign minister's comments at the UN within the last few days were very, very tough. Where Secretary of State Lincoln has called for a longer and stronger accord to replace the 2015 JCPOA, which runs in 2030. The Iranian foreign minister directly rejected what he called the so-called longer and stronger deal. And he said that we expect to get greater sanctions relief than we got under the JCPOA. Now, given this confrontation, I still believe that both the U.S. and Iran see it in their national interests to get back into an accord. And my friend Rob Malley is negotiating that for the U.S. And I believe that the best we will be able to see will be an interim accord, which will get Iran back into a slightly stronger JCPOA with perhaps slightly more sanctions relief, but nothing more. Now, I know that many of our colleagues in the region rightly, rightly want Iran constrained not just in this dimension, but in terms of their building missiles, in terms of their support for terrorist groups and for their violations of rights and interventions uh, in countries like Lebanon and in Syria. But that unfortunately will not happen or wait than the nuclear agreement can bear. But I do want to mention to my colleagues from uh, the Arab states that even if there is a re-entrance of the U.S. and Iran into the JCPOA or to a slightly expanded JCPOA, the U.S. continues to maintain sanctions, separate sanctions, on Iran for its nuclear missile program and for its support for terrorism. And as shown by the recent military attack that I mentioned on Iranian-backed militias operating in Iraq, it will not hesitate to take such actions. Thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this panel and in my dear friend Thierry Montreal's World Policy Conference. I'm more than happy to take any questions. Well, thank you for staying up so late. It's around, I think, what, two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning it's where you are. It's not so much staying up late as getting up early. <laughs> anyway, thank you all the same. Um, so last but not least, uh, we have Mr. Mamdu Uh who is the founding president of the Global Relations Forum, a founding partner of Kanunum, uh, chairman of the Croton Consultancy, and a founder of a university, and uh, also a graduate of Course 6 and Course 14 at MIT. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Well, let me start, like everyone else, by thanking the organizers and Thierry de Montbrial for really being persistent about this conference and making this happen. I, it's a very personal thing. I really, truly had missed being with friends, making new friends, the exchanges at dinners. This was fabulous. So thank you from the bottom of my heart that this was, uh, we very much appreciate it. Um, it is, I mean, when I looked at the program, I liked the seeing the Middle East on the third day, although a very extended Middle East emphasis, still it's the third day. To me, that signified the Middle East crises, the pressing nature of Middle East has been pushed back. The world has bigger fish to fry these days. That's always good. I mean, I, I felt comfortable with that choice. 
Usually, when we talk about the Middle East, myself included, I, we end up on a downbeat note. I remember when the, the, the pre-COVID, my last presentation was in Singapore on the Middle East, and I was going on about how the Asian miracle, economic miracle, was not applicable to the Middle East, that the Middle East is in a deadlock, it's not going to happen. So there's always this negative sentiment, negative analysis. When, after the sort of, the experience of COVID, when we start post-COVID with again the Middle East, I thought I really don't want to start with a negative message. So what I did, uh, sort of with a clean palette, I wanted to look at the news headings about the Middle East for the last 12 months. I just literally went through them, read quite a bit, just the clippings. And I think there is something in the air. I mean, you look at the list, Libya in a much better position. We are, you know, hopefully we'll have elections there. The IS and related radical terror seems to be under control. The Abraham Accords are historic. The Saudi-Iranian communication going on in Baghdad, in Iraq, not Baghdad, in Iraq, uh, is Baghdad. critically important. Intra-GCC rapprochement is very good. And then the Turkish UAE Egypt thawing, let's say, because we just heard the minister, it's go going very slowly, but nevertheless, there is thawing. So you put all those together and there seems to be something in the air. Either it is my post-COVID or, you know, still we are in it, but coming to the end, the, my deep desire to see something positive or there is something substantive. Then I came across uh, Vitaly Naumkin's paper on the possibility of a third renaissance for the region, and I was further encouraged. So maybe there is something in the air. My usual analysis for the region is more, like, more or less like an unsolvable puzzle. Uh, the, it, it, the, the whole region, obviously, unfortunately, rests on a centuries-old rifts fault lines, ethnic, sectarian, religious, and it's all over the place. It is at the sub-state level, state level, sub-regional level, regional, region-wide. It is just a fragmented, ethnically, sectarian, fragmented community, fragmented geography. That's what it is. And when you start with that, my basic analysis, I won't go into the details of that, that makes it open to external power politics, because you can play sides based on your interests, very vulnerable. Domestically, it opens the way for uh, sectarian politics, sectarian government, and that creates state capture, and that creates ineffective governments. So when you put external meddling plus ineffective governments, then International capital doesn't feel comfortable enough to flow here, so economically you don't get much. So what you have, the economics of it, domestic politics and international politics, create a vicious deadlock and it is stuck in a bad equilibrium. It's, and it's such a puzzle that you, know, you have to solve all three at the same time, it seems, because it's not a linear problem, it's a complex non-linear problem, and there is no way of saying, okay, if I start here, I can just follow the whole thing and the, the whole thing will move to a better state. And that, of course, is a very bad, uh, sort of very upsetting downbeat analysis. On top of it, uh, because of all the grievances uh, that the populations have lived through, there was, and there probably still is some, impatience in the public about the solution. So you, are, you have a puzzle in your hand, which requires multi, you know, you have to solve three things at the same time or more, and you are under time pressure coming from the public. So it seems very difficult. But, again, I uh, said, starting from data of the last 12 months, there is something in the air. So I did go back and try to reformulate my model to see how else we can think about this, the whole system. And what I think is happening, or at least what I will test over the coming months, is possibly this puzzle in our hands has been exposed to systemic shocks. Basically, we've shaken the puzzle and the pieces have changed place and they have been aligned in different ways. So it wasn't, I mean, we, we, we can't necessarily solve it again linearly, but it is a different puzzle. 
it's, it, it looks different. What were those shocks? I mean, we can just go through that. There is obviously, we lived, everybody lived through COVID. So it's an across the board systemic shock. There is the debt accumulation on more or less every nation, which conditions what is to come. There is the history, the memory, the tragic memory of Libya, Syria on, in our minds. There is the prospect of climate for all of us. So these are all systemic risks that we'll have to deal with. And I think these, these uh, sorry, systemic effects, systemic shocks to the system, I think these systemic shocks uh, impact both the internal dynamics and the external dynamics, potentially in a positive way. Internally, I think what probably we have, we will observe and we are observing, the societies of the region are, they, because we have been, you know, we've been all searching for uh, the argument of win-win arguments in our societies, in these societies, rather than zero-sum. I think the last, these shocks have shown us not the win-win, the benefits of win-win, but the costs of lose-lose. So if when you see that if you do not have an effective governance structure, you end up with a lose-lose scenario, the opposite of lose-lose is working together for a win-win structure. So I think it's, it's, it's a, in a rather perverse way, these uh, shocks have indicated the possibility of a win-win path for the region. Two, I think sense of time has changed. The impatient publics may have more understanding for well-meaning governments. And I think there has been a jolt to the governments themselves. And I think in the UAE, we've been hearing from our uh, hosts about how effectively the UAE has been managing these crises. So this is internally. Now, externally, I'll go very fast. When I look at the external meddling and the potential for changes in that dynamic, I think, yes, we will have big power rivalry, but this is, in the region, it is penny-pinching, low-cost rivalry, because there is the debt problem, and every big power is also concerned with its own issues, domestic issues. So there isn't all that much money from anyone to meddle in this region. So that, that, that I think, is important. Then uh, there is the tech competition and climate issue, bigger fish to fry. So the Middle East takes a backseat a reprioritization downwards. There is talk of end of fossil fuel, which could again be a positive effect, but I think not so fast. I think this region still has a few decades to go with fossil, uh, fossil fuels. But I think uh, the technology competition controlling microchips and the precision equipment for microchips is a much more surgical way to compete rather than you know, unsettling the whole energy system globally. So I think we will not see much of that. And then there's, of course, uh, the subsiding tariff. So all those effects, I think, cut across the big powers and suggest that we may be in uh, for a period where there won't be as much meddling. What are the exceptions and uh, sort of issues to watch? U.S., I think the Iranian issue, uh, Mr. Eisenstadt has outlined it, the Iranian issue is an open wound and I, that can unsettle this whole thing. From the Russian perspective, I think Russia has become a stakeholder in the region and Russia wants stability in the region. I agree with Vitaly Naumkin, uh, but I think there is always the risk of linking the Ukraine problem with the Middle East, as was experienced before. I hope that doesn't happen. With China, we heard Mr. Rudd, uh, I mean, China is still sort of trying to change the balance. If China uses this region, as an element in that shift of balance, that is something to watch out for. And in the EU, I mean, I think EU as in totality doesn't, uh, sort of is not a very active actor, but the nation states are. And I, I see France and Mr. Macron in the region quite frequently, which is again, very positive. As long as the nation states of Europe are conciliatory powers, I think that'll be helpful, but there is a lot of baggage. So one needs to do it with care. Finally, just a few words on Turkey. Now, I, I'm not a diplomat, but I spent the best part of COVID lockdowns with two former undersecretaries to go to the depths of Turkish foreign policy, the philosophy of Turkish foreign policy. When the nation was established in 1923, it was very clear. Strategically, it was a nation building process. And it was very clear strategically that the nation needed to have peace 
with its neighbors and beyond so that we could focus on internal matters. And that is a cardinal rule that has been ingrained into the philosophy of the Republic for a long, long period. I mean, some of these basic tenets that come from Atatürk himself and were, I think, in the custody of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was do not meddle in the affairs of other nations, uh, be equidistant to Middle Eastern conflicts and affairs, that's very critical. That's really a cardinal rule again. And do, going beyond, don't give advice to anyone if they don't seek your advice. So these are fundamentals of Turkish foreign policy. What, how come, of course, I mean, many of you will think the Turkish foreign policy lately has been on a more activist strain, arguably. Uh, the, the possibility, the, the argument, the discussion we have back at home is, Two things are drawing us into the region. One, the PKK, YPG terror. This is very close to heart. And the second one is the refugee problem. Those two problems, could we handle them the last 10 years with this dispassionate equidistance approach? Or did we have to make an exception, an aberration in our policy? That discussion is still going on. I don't know the answer. I think historically we'll look back and see which way it is. But the bottom line is, I think it is in the interest of Turkey, it is in the interest of the region, it is in the interest of the world for Turkey to be at equidistant from Middle Eastern conflicts. And to do that, we need to find fast solutions to the refugee problem and the YPG terror coming from the region. Once those two are resolved, I think Turkey will go back to its traditional uh, foreign policy uh, philosophy of being equidistant from the region and contributing to a more positive uh, regional uh, future. So with that, I think there is something in the air. I don't know if this is the turning point, but I think there is a possibility. This is a new puzzle. Dialogues like this, conferences like this, this is where we have the opportunity to think about the new puzzle and hopefully put the pieces together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mamdou. Well, what you uh, mentioned about the onset of the uh, Turkish Republic actually echoes very much with us in Iraq. Uh, we were engaged in an existential battle and now we uh, are engaged in a reconstruction process uh, the really interesting thing about the uh, politics of Iraq right now, and you've put your finger on uh, an important point of you know, tensions between communities. Uh, if you look at the political uh, landscape in Iraq, the uh, tensions or conflicts are not between communities. They're within political groupings within communities. And so the really interesting uh, thing that I take out of this is that it is very possible, in fact, uh, probable that we will have cross-cutting uh, uh, alliances that represent politics as it should be within a national framework. And with this, I, I think we're, we're, we're actually quite optimistic looking to the elections I alluded to uh, at the beginning of my intervention. We don't have much time, but uh, if the... We don't have time. No. We're done. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Numkin. Um, thank you, uh, Stuart Eisenstadt, for being up so late. And uh, thank you for your interventions. And again, thank you for your hospitality. Not at all. Thank, you. Oh. thank you. And Thierry, thank you for ho holding this remarkable event and pulling it together. Yeah.